given him uh, that list there in, in, in Titus 1. And uh, so he is going to, let's welcome him. God bless you. Thank you got 40 brother. minutes. Everybody does. And if it's a little uh, bit more, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I only, this, thank you, Travis. I take, a, I take a drink right before I preach, and then I don't take another drink for like an hour or so. All right? So don't look so excited, Jerry. I'm uh, not trying to compare uh, anything, but I'm, I'm, look, Brother Bill, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to boost your ego. That was an egg. Okay, I just, after, uh, I mean, guys, couldn't you tell? I mean, he only had a couple of hours of preparation. You could tell that was just a golden, that was a golden egg. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, all of the messages really have, uh, spoke to my heart, prepared my heart this morning. Um, I think Brother Ron has uh, given me a uh, tough assignment. Um, I just want to say uh, before we really, before we get into this, and Brother Travis made it clear last night, um, our job's not to um, condemn or accommodate, that's my, not my job this morning, but simply to uh, proclaim the word of God. Amen? Um, I'm thankful for a God who doesn't leave us in the dark, uh, but a God who uh, gives us his expectations for our life. Amen? And uh, for our ministries. And really these... Uh, uh, qualifications that we're going to look at this morning aren't just... Uh, I, I preached this message to uh, my church a couple of weeks ago. And, and really, where do preachers come from? The man in the pulpit comes from where? The pew. And, and so, really, these uh, uh, character traits... I think Brother Darrell just, uh, we were talking, used the word uh, credibility. Um, the credibility of our Christian life, and I, man, there's, there is a lack of credibility today in Christianity. Uh, I, I think all of these things apply to every single one of us, really. Um, Brother Ron uh, this is, this is what he wrote, you know, what he sent me. He, it says uh, that my assigned subject is stand and lead in Christian character and conduct. Uh, the thought is this, Paul left Titus in Crete with an agenda. First on Titus' list of objectives was to appoint leaders in the churches there in Crete. Paul especially has the office of bishop or pastor in mind here. And he outlines some qualifications and or character traits that stand in contrast to the surrounding culture. Everything starts with leadership. Churches need leaders who do more than speak the truth. They live it out before others. This passage is known to present the qualifications for a pastor... And these qualifications are character traits that must be present in the life of a pastor and in every believer. Leaders must lead with their lives more than a title or office. God works despite us. God has certainly worked despite us me. Let's look in uh, Titus 1. Uh, we're going to read uh, the, the context here, the, the passage, and, and Paul is uh, uh, writing here uh, to Titus, and he says in verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, if any be bl blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, 
not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Uh, Daryl said, uh, we're going to need to uh, be reordained when we get done today. Not sure. Hey, there was a survey that was done a few years ago uh, asking uh, several hundred church members to write down what they desired of a pastor. Here's their uh, top responses. People desire a pastor who... Uh, possessed a love for the congregation. They want a man who is an effective preacher, a man with strong character, uh, a good work ethic, someone who casts a vision and demonstrates healthy leadership. They desire a leader who is joyous and transparent, also someone who doesn't give in to critics. And finally, people said they want a pastor who models evangelism. I think I can agree with all those things. An old preacher told me one time, you know, your people want a, a pastor that they can be proud of. There was a, another survey that was done. This was done of deacons. Uh, they were Southern Baptist deacons, and they were asked what they expected from their pastor. And here's the minimum expectations for the pastor to fulfill each week. Prayer at church, 14 hours. Sermon preparation, 18 hours. Outreach and evangelism, 10 hours. Counseling, 10 hours. Hospital and home visits, 15 hours. Administrative functions, 18 hours. I, in Wetmore, I have at least that many hours of administrative functions. <laughs> Community involvement, 5 hours. Denominational involvement, 5 hours. I'm, I'm sure I talk... I probably talked to Jerry on the phone through the week at least five hours. That would be denominational, wouldn't that, Jerry? Be denominational involvement. I mean, he is the Baptist preacher, right? Amen? That's right. Church meetings, five hours. Worship services and preaching, four hours. And then other is 10 hours. Now, if you did the math really quick, that's 114 hours a week. That would require a pastor to work more than 16 hours a day for seven days a week. I don't have any deacons in Wetmore, just saying. <laughs> uh, people have a lot of different expectations of a pastor, amen? But there is something more important or should be more important to us as pastors, as preachers, than what church members think. Our, our purpose, really, our priority ought to be to please the Lord. And I've told my church through the years, several times, and, and not, they understand. I think they understand now. I don't do what I do for you. I don't, uh, I don't spend time in uh, preparation and prayer and uh, to step in the pulpit to preach. You know, I, I don't serve uh, this uh, church. Uh, I, I don't mow the grass. I don't weed whack. I don't shovel snow for you, etc. I do it for the Lord. Um, I really, and I've said this to my church, I don't care what you think. Um, I care what the Lord thinks. And if I can, uh, you know, Ron, when he <laughs> asked, 
asked me to, I was a little offended, really. He, when he asked me to take this text, he used the word seasoned. He said, I was looking for a seasoned. I have considered myself, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I guess I've hung out with old guys. But I, I have considered myself to be a young preacher. I, I didn't know I had passed into the season. <laughs> Embrace it. September, I'll be at what more 29 years, so I guess. But I would say this, if, if I've learned anything and if I could pass on anything, to a younger preacher, if you pastor for people, it will destroy your ministry. It will destroy you. You you will be discouraged. You will be disappointed. And, And in some cases, you'll be defeated. Now, don't take that wrong i love my church and every every pastor here loves amen we all listen we all love our church our people i mean i, I wouldn't trade in, in, in 29 years at, at at wetmore i've had opportunities to go somewhere else but i am right exactly where god wants me to be and i love my people but I don't pastor for them. Can I tell you, you need to pastor for the Lord. He will never leave you discouraged. He will never leave you disappointed. He will never leave you defeated. Amen? It's about Him. And if you'll make it about the Lord, as Brother Bill said, hey, who cares? Jesus would say, who cares? Follow me, right? Follow me. If you'll follow Christ, you will have a long and fruitful ministry. It will be exactly what God wants you to have. And praise him for that. Well, God has outlined his expectations. Aren't you you thankful for a God who doesn't leave us in the dark, right? You know, hey, hey, uh, uh, am, I, am I doing a good job? Well, I, I, I don't know. You know, if you had a boss that way, I, I don't know if you're doing, I don't know. Wait till Friday, right? Uh, you'll find out. What, God gives us exactly what his expectations are for us in the ministry. And here in Titus, Paul uses the term elder, uh, bishop. There are three terms in the, in the Bible you, you know that are interchangeable in Scripture that I think really refer to the same office, elder, bishop, pastor. And when you read the qualifications that God has set here in his word, he emphasizes the importance of personal character and also theological competency. And and I think both of these are are sort of missing today if if, if we want to talk about big umbrella Christianity. I'm not really here to talk about big umbrella Christianity. I'm an independent Baptist. And I think in my 30 some odd years of ministry, I think some of that is beginning to lack within our churches. Look at what God expects from those who he has called to shepherd his flock. In verse 5, Paul charges Titus to set things in order. In order. I'm thankful for a God of order, uh, not a God of disorder. Amen? God says what he means, he means what he says. One of his responsibilities was to ordain elders in in each city. And Paul goes into a detail describing the the qualities, the the, the requirements 
of, of those elders. And uh, these characteristics are 180 degrees the opposite of what we find listed in verses 10 through 16. Those unruly and vain talkers, those deceivers. And, and so it, it's clear to me, and I, and I think to all of us as we look at this passage of Scripture, that faithfulness is paramount. Moreover, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20, it's, uh, excuse me, verse 2 has been quoted today. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And so I'm going to break this passage down really in, in, in five points of faithfulness. The man of God, and, and really I, I think we can apply this, everyone needs to apply this to their lives. Number one, we need, we need to be faithful to our church, faithful to our wife, faithful to our children, faithful to the Lord, and faithful to his word. Verse 5, we see faithful to the church. He says, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. He tells them to set things in order. And so obviously there must have been some problems, some disorder in the church for uh, Titus to be instructed to to straighten or set some things in order, straighten some things out. There were some things that were lacking. And one of the needs was elders, pastors. Listen, churches need godly leadership. That's God's order. That is His order. And, and, and Paul felt that Titus was the right man for the job. A church is out of order when they don't have a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd who's entrusted with the responsibility of caring for and leading God's people. I found out through the ministry, uh, through the years, that if I don't lead, someone else will. And it's usually not the person I want to lead. And I could go into stories, and so could you. Ephesians 4, verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The responsibility of a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Lead them in the study of the Word of God. I say this to my people all the time. Get in the Word and get the Word in you. And here is the Word this morning. And so follow along in your Bibles and let's... Our job. Lead, feed, protect the flock that God has given us. The word shepherd means to, to literally care for, protect, guide. It, it is the term that God uses for, for pastor. That's what pastor means, to shepherd. A shepherd is to, or pastor is to pray and prepare and preach and protect the flock that's under his care. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 says, Elders, the elders which... Are among you, I exhort, Peter says, who are also and who who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. There's the leadership. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being lords over God's heritage but being in samples to the flock. A pastor must be faithful 
to his church. He can't compromise. He must be bold, even in the face of conflict. The man of God must protect the flock from heresy, from false teachers who the Bible calls wolves in in sheep's clothing. Pastor's job is to fix and repair what's broken in the church. And that's why Paul left Titus there, to set in order the things that were lacking. Preacher, it's your job. It's not an evangelist's job. It's not a visiting preacher's job to fix what's broken in your church. All the years at Wetmore, I've never had an evangelist in our church. I'm gonna, and you say, why not? Number one, I think evangelist in the Bible, that term. I'm going to step outside my lane here, Brother Ron, just for a minute. All right? I really think that term means missionary. We call them missionaries. You know, the term missionary is really a Catholic term, right? I mean, it's really a Catholic. We use the term missionary, missions. What? That's Catholic, right? I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, Paul was an evangelist. And a church planter. He went into a city, he evangelized, and he planted a church. It was not a schedule-driven ministry. Right? I, I just don't find that in the Bible. I, I Now, let me get in my lane. All right, I'm going to get in my lane. All right, I'm going to get back. But listen, and, and, I, and, and I've known some evangelists through the years, and I'm not, I'm not just, don't, judge me, but they believe their job is to come in to your church and fix it. I had a young guy, a part, I knew he was coming. He had visited every church in our area, and I knew he was coming to mine. And one Sunday morning, you know, I pull up in the driveway, he'd beat me there, you know, he was there, and, and he steps, struts up, you know, I'm, you know, and I just confronted him right there. Look, I said, you know what? We ain't buying what you're selling. <laughs> Man, he, he didn't, I, and he, other church members are coming, and, and, and uh, he got, I mean, he, he got a little heated. And uh, I gave my two cents worth, and one of my church members said, man, what? What was going on? And I told them, I said, look, I'm, you're, I'm not giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself. or so You want to come in and worship with us? Great. But I, and one of my church members asked me that, uh, that evening what was going on. And I told my church, this was your shepherd protecting you. Now, I've had, I've had men come in and speak and and the men that have come are, are men with pastor's hearts. I, I don't want somebody that's going to come in and, you know, skin my sheep alive and run down the road. Amen? Pastor, listen, your job, protect your church. Listen, be, be faithful to your church. Your, your church is not a stepping stone to something bigger and better. That's not what the man of God is called to do. You're to be faithful to the assignment God's given you until he gives you another one. When I came to Wetmore, I prayed that God would give me 25 years. He's given me 25 years. When God gave me 25 years, I told the church, I said, now I'm praying for another 15 years. I said, I'll be here 40 years and I'll be 70 years old. 
That's what I'm praying for. Faithful to your church. There were some people I heard say, oh me or something when I said that. I wasn't sure. There were some groans, I think. A pastor must be faithful to his church. A pastor, verse 6, must be faithful to his wife. If any, be blameless, the husband of one wife. This uh, qualification is so controversial in Christianity today. It has uh, become so um, in independent Baptist ranks as well. I'm not here this morning to define for you your theology and your convictions. I will answer to the Lord for my ministry, not yours, and you will answer to the Lord for your ministry and not mine. I do believe we could all agree that God's perfect plan for marriage is one man for one woman for one lifetime. That's God's perfect plan. I think we could also agree that for a pastor to be qualified, he must be faithfully devoted to his wife. Paul echoes this statement over in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes about uh, the husband and wife relationship. And he says, listen, that, that really models or should model or picture the relationship of Christ and his church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is Christ's bride. Listen, there's only one kind of church that I find in the Bible. It's a local, visible. I, I'm a Baptist. It's a Baptist church. Amen? Listen, I, you know, this term Baptist brighter, you know, I, I, uh, you know, some people think, hey, that, that just means uh, you, you think only Baptists are going to heaven. No, I don't. I don't. There's some Baptists that aren't going to heaven. They need to get saved, amen? I, Sam Davison, I was at a men's retreat one time. Sam Davison, man, he was preaching. He, he, was, uh, he, he got on, uh, man, I'm a you know, Baptist. And, my, and I got all excited. And afterwards I said to him, I said, man, I just waited for you to say, and I'm a Baptist brighter. He said, oh, no, I'm not one of those. Listen, uh, do you believe that your church is a spouse to Christ? I mean, do you believe that? Listen, if, if you rebaptize someone who comes to your, to your church looking for membership, if you rebaptize them because they don't have scriptural New Testament Baptist baptism, you know what you are? Just saying. Listen, the church, our marriages ought to reflect Christ's love and his relationship with his church. Amen? And that ought to be true of every Christian. Certainly true of the pastor. This relationship, there, there was a young preacher who came to an old preacher and he said, you know, I, I need your help. He said, no, I'm... I'm in a terrible situation here. He says, you know, I, I, I think I've drifted into idolatry. The old preacher said, what, what do you mean you've drifted? Into? Well, he says, I think I love my wife too much. I, 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 I put her on too high of a pedestal. I'm, a, I'm afraid. I, I, I'm into idolatry. And the old preacher looked at him and he said, well, listen, do you think you love your wife more than Christ loved the church? He said, well, no. No, I, I guess not. Well, he said, that's the limit. That's the limit. You know, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, as much as I love my church, 
And I love every member in it. It does not compare to the love that I have for my wife. I, I don't know about you, but God gave me a wife before he ever gave me a ministry. Unfortunately, too many men consider their leadership to be so important that they neglect their home life. And some are so arrogant as to think that without them, the church won't survive. I, I chuckled, Bill, I don't know what guys you're hanging out with, man. A million point three? I mean, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, there's an extra thousand. You know, that's me, right? A million point three. Do you know that my, my phone doesn't, doesn't ring very much from my church members? And do you know why? Because I haven't cultivated that. I played golf with a guy one time. I mean, he could barely put the ball. His phone rang so many times. Church members. I, listen, I'm, I, I'm, I am not essential to their Christian life. Does that make sense? I don't have to have my finger on everything that every member of my church does. I'm not their dad. I'm the pastor. And they're adults. But there are men that believe that their ministry is so vital that without them, the church won't survive. The church will survive without you. But your marriage won't. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. I've taken that to heart in my ministry. And I decided a long time ago that I would let Jesus build his church. I would honor his word and that it's his church. And that I would make my wife and family a priority in my life. Listen, if you love your ministry more than your wife and family, it's pretty likely uh, you'll lose both. And those that are close to me and know me know that without my wife, nobody would want me anyways. I know that's true of Brother Ron. So I'm going to keep my wife first. Love your wives. Lead your church by loving your wife. A pastor must be faithful to, to the church, faithful to his wife. Verse 6 says, faithful to his children. Having faithful children, not accused of riot, or unruly. The man of God is expected to have submissive and obedient children. They are not required to be perfect. And generations of pastors' kids have proved that to be true. That is not possible. But they are to be Faithful and obedient and not wild and out of control. The family is a proving ground for leadership. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 4, A pastor should be one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Gravity means seriousness. It's a serious deal. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? A godly leader will be a godly father. 
who will do whatever is necessary to nurture and train his children in the Word of God. And not just in the Word of God, but according to the Word of God. There's a difference. And the difference is this. Put into practice what you preach. The Scripture commands in Ephesians 6, 4, says, And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. People expect many things of their pastor. They want a man who lives an exemplary life, and they want someone who can lead others to faith in Christ, and they, they want others who, who can teach the truth of the, of the Word of God. They, they want someone who, who is an example that they can follow. They want a pastor that has character and integrity and practices what he preaches. Where do you find someone like that? Look at his family. Look at those who know him best. Does his leadership at home have a positive impact on his children? And if not, if he cannot control his own home, how can he lead the flock of God? And the answer is he can't. And I understand the real life situation that every child is responsible to the Lord for their own choices. I get that. I understand that. But I'm simply saying that it's vitally important for the pastor to be faithful to his children. What, what does faithfulness look like? What does it look like to be faithful to your children? I think it's really defined in a four-letter word. T-I-M-E. Time. I am so thankful for a mom and dad who came to every event I was participating in. My dad was the announcer of our football team. I know this is hard to believe, but I was the quarterback of my high school football team. I threw a pass one time, an alignment. Not, I know it's hard to believe, as tall as I am. I threw the pass, an alignment batted it up in the air. And I, I caught my own pass. It was just like... Moses in the Red Sea. I'm telling you, the defense just parted. You know, my breakaway five point something speed, man, 40 yard, you know. I was, and my dad, my dad's on the speaker. I mean, go, Brian, go, Brian, go. I was wrestling. This kid had me in a, in a hold. I mean, I was fighting to keep my shoulders off the mat. And it got, it got just, you could have heard a pin drop. And I'm fighting to not be pinned. And my dad yells out, get him, Brian, get him. I'm thankful. I'm thankful he taught me some things about loving my wife and my family. When my boys were in high school, my dad and my mom would travel 1,400 miles to come and watch them play football. Make time for your kids. Everything my kids have ever done, I'm going to be there. 
And you know that church member, you know, that's maybe trying to monopolize your time? Or what? Listen, you know what? They'll live. But your kids, I'm telling you, they'll never forget. Now listen, I'm old enough now, I have 11 grandkids. You know what? Grandpa's there. I, I can't tell you what a, what a blessing it is to bring Brendan down here with me. And I tell you, just uh, I can't tell you what it means in my heart when he, last night we were walking back out to the car after service, he said, uh, Grandpa, I love you. You can stand to lose a church member or two. You can't afford to lose your kids. Pastor must be faithful to the Lord. Verses 7 and 8. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Is it possible for the man of God, for the pastor to become disqualified? Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Unapproved, rejected, worthless. That's what that word means. Listen, these verses here, these, these things here in verses 7 and 8, lived out will protect a pastor from being a castaway. Pastor must be blameless. I, I'm just quickly, that, that's not sinless perfection, but, but it does mean being above reproach or accusation. Not self willed. The pastor isn't someone who's arrogant, someone who, who, who has to constantly assert his own will. A pastor is not a, a dictator who always gets his way. Listen, you're wrong sometimes. Just ask your wife. I, I don't know where I read this, but leadership does not equal infallibility. Not soon angry. Pastor shouldn't be quick tempered. Not given to wine. I'm going to skip that one. I, I mean, we don't need to get on that, do we? Brother Charles Thomas, I, Brother Ron, I don't know if you'll remember you when your dad preached there at Antioch, went, went through the, he came to our house for dinner. I, I was uh, 24 years old and surrendered to the ministry. And Brother Charles Thomas said this to me, I'll never forget it. 35 years ago at my house for dinner, he said three things disqualify men from the ministry more than anything else. So this one gets men in trouble. Women, money, and booze. Ain't changed in 35 years. No striker. That literally means not a fist fighter. Not given to filthy lucre. This speaks of someone who seeks financial gain at any cost. He must be a lover of hospitality. Literally means one who loves his guests. Loves his guests. Lover of good men. Having a strong affection for what's good in people. Sober. That's self-controlled. Being sensible. Level-headed. Just. 
Seeking that which is proper, right, fitting, holy. Speaks of one who is obedient to God's word and God's will for his life. In temperate means, having self-control. A man of God can be a devoted husband. He can be an exemplary father. He can be a fantastic preacher who expounds the word of God. But if he isn't faithful to the Lord, nothing else matters. You can't preach the truth and then live your life contrary to what you preached as the truth of the Word of God and be a leader. The final qualification of a pastor is he must be faithful to the Word. And uh, I've used up all my time and probably more. I, uh, I think Brother Travis talked about being faithful to the word last night. But you see it there. He says, holding fast the faithful word as, as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. A faithful pastor, a faithful leader must be continuously devoted to the truth, to the word of God. And I... We could talk about your devotional life, your study habits. I could. Uh, can, can I uh, encourage you to guard your mind from garbage? Um, I am thankful. or godly men that I have been able to look up to uh, through um, my Christian life and in my ministry. Men that I believe e exemplify these characteristics. Are they perfect? No. But are they men of integrity and, and men of character? And uh, Yes. I have benefited from those men. And I want to be one of those men. I guess now that I'm seasoned. You know, we need to run the race to the end. Amen? And, uh, man, we live in Hard not to get upset, ain't it, Brother Travis, about the times we live in. But man, people need the Lord. I mean, that's, that's the only hope, right? Uh, listen, uh, you know, all of your rants on Facebook against, uh, you know, AOC or, you know, the whatever. What's going on, that, that isn't, that isn't going to isn't going to change one soul for Christ. But I tell you, if, if we're uh, people of integrity, who will get involved in our communities, and people can see honest love and compassion, that'll go a long ways. To them trusting Christ as their Savior. So let's be that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word, the truth of your word, the power of your word. And God, I just uh, trust today that you will do what you do, that only you can do with your word in our hearts and in our lives. God, help us um, to let you do that work. And uh, we give you all the honor and all the praise, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.